Welcome to Bitter Reality Brewing. Today's the top 10 tips, tricks, recommendations, hacks, suggestions, whatever you want to call them. Don't forget, like, subscribe, keep sharing. Definitely appreciate it. Definitely appreciate it. This is week 25, and I'm going to focus on brewing a bag or brewing a bag related topics. So number one, right off the bat, if you're new to brewing, you've never brewed, and you just want to try it out, you don't have any equipment, anything, consider brewing a bag. And I know you're going, I don't understand what that means. You're putting your grains in a bag, you're putting it in a pot like this, you add your hot water, or you put your bag in with your hot water, stir it up and you let it sit or mash, which means basically it's sitting for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature to pull out the starches that you're gonna boil and convert to sugar. You will also hear the term partial mash because a lot of new brewers buy kits. And when you're buying a kit, you get a partial mash. It's gonna come with a dry or sometimes liquid extract, which don't worry about that, that's the easy part. And it'll probably come with a Molson bag that either will have your grains or you'll put your grains in. It's just a giant stretchy sock kind of like thick pantyhose, it'll stretch. This is a one-time use thing. When you use it, and sometimes it's cut more down to size, you throw it away. The holes get stretched and all kinds of particles can come through and you will get some grains in your wort, which is the water or liquid runoff from that of your grains that you're going to add yeast and then the yeast will make it beer. Great, great starter. When I first started, I did brew in a bag. Um, yeah, they came with Molson bags and then eventually I bought brew in a bags. They're reusable, you can keep using the good ones, not the Molson ones, so. But we're gonna go into number two. Number two, especially if you're new to brewing, have a spare bag. Yes, brew in a bag, have a spare bag for your hops. Like this one's been used probably 200 times and for your grains. As you can see, I have two. This one's got little tears at the top, but it's at the top, so I'm not too worried. And as I've shown in another video, I have more spares. And I don't do brew in a bag most of the time anymore, but I have them because I do testing, I do experiments, and sometimes I'm like, you know what, maybe I'll do a brew in a bag. So I have them. Number three, brew in a bag afterwards, if you're not concerned with scorching, which means if you've got a strike temperature, which means your water is sitting at around say 154, and you dump your grains in and you stir it all up and you drops it down because the grains are kind of cool, and drops it down to 150 and that's your mash tip and you cover it up and set it to the side, you, don't really need a brew in a bag. You just need to put your grains in your pot. And you're sitting there going, I don't understand. You just said do a brew in a bag. What you can do, and I've done this before where I only had two brew in a bag bags, but I was doing four one gallon batches all at the same time. When it's done, you can just dump it in the, ba the bag, pick the bag up, there's your wart. Give it a little bit to drip, throw your grains away, Go do your next one and your next one and your next one. It's a great way to do a assembly line when you're trying to test maybe certain types of grain or certain types of hop additions. You can break it down and do a bunch of, you could do 10 one gallon batches with one bag back to back. I know it's a little weird, but if you do a lot of experimenting, I know there's a good handful of you out there doing it. That is something you can do. And I'm gonna go back to saying no brew in a bag needed. Although I said no brew in a bag, use it afterwards. If you have a really good colander like this, and I'm this is more for one gallon. I know you've got five gallon brew in a bag, people out there going, are you insane? I can't get all my grains in there. That would take forever. You take your grains that are in here that are sitting there mashing, and when you're done, you pour it in here. If you're gonna do a little sparge, you can put a little bit of hot water over the top, rinse your grains, lift it up. If for some reason your colander, which this one's amazing, I got this I think from Ikea and uh, so you can get them on Amazon, which I'll leave a link down below for that. But if some of the grains slip through, repeat the process. You're essentially creating a grain bed, just like we do with all grain and the big brew systems. You're creating a grain bed to help capture and keep all the particulates from getting through and just letting the liquid run through. So yeah, you don't really need a brew in a bag bag if you have a good quality colander, if you want to do it that way, it's just a different way of doing it. It's not one that's better than the other. They're just different. I mean, honestly, they're different. Move some of this stuff out of the way. I do recommend a hot bag. That's number five. I do recommend a hot bag for brewing a bag brewers. You can also use the Molson bag for your hot bags. Some of us still use those for our dry hopping. I do. Um, occasionally I do dry hopping or most of the time I do dry hopping this way, but in a keg. But 
there's so many uses for brewing a bag type bags, even beyond just what you think of off the top of your head. The reason I like the hop bags is if you don't have a good system in a way to get the hop matter out, or you don't have a hop spider because you're adding a ton of hops. Like I use these when I'm only adding a little bit of hops instead of the hop spider, because it's just easier to clean. Plus, got a bonus. When you have your hops in a bag and you go to pull it up, and you got a silicone thing like this, like this little doggy, you can squeeze your hops. You don't have to worry about any tannins or anything like that. You just squeeze it and get all that goodness out of there and then set it aside, dump it. Be careful, make sure you throw it away where your dog's not gonna get to it. Hops are toxic to dogs. You can also use this and have your hop bag up against the side of the pot and just kind of squeeze it out. Be careful, the liquid's gonna be crazy hot and can burn you and that's something to be aware of. Number six, you can use a sous vide. And I have one from Yeti. I'm gonna mention David Heath Brewing for something else that I'm gonna give him some credit on. Two things, one, he reminded me something and something I'd never seen, which was kind of cool. But you can use a sous vide, stick it in your pot if you don't have a burner or maybe your spouse is like, I can't stand it. it, smells bad, you go brew in the garage, but you don't have a burner, there you go for your match. Now you're still gonna to need to boil, which hopefully you do that out on a propane tank. But you can stick this in to heat the water up and to maintain the temperatures. David Heath Brewing mentioned that Inkberg came out with one, which is pretty cool. I didn't know they had one out now. I like the Yeti because my first one broke after three uses and they immediately just replaced it. No questions. We'll just take care of you, which was awesome. So you get this one, you got the Inkberg, but amazing at controlling your temperatures and keeping your temperature exactly where you want it. It's got a little propeller in here, which leads me into number seven. And this is the one that David Heath showed me that I had never seen and a great tip. If you're going to use a sous vide, to heat and control your temperatures. Get one of these little torpedo looking things that I use for dry hopping in my keg. Remove the lid. You're gonna have to modify it. But to show you what it does, it goes over this. So you're gonna have to cut it, line it up, and cut the top piece off so that it fits over your sous vide device. What it's gonna do is it's gonna protect the inlets and the little propeller from getting clogged from anything that could get through the bags. Um, from your grains so that way you don't mess up your sous vide and maybe overheat it or burn it up or just cause a problem in general. So credit and thanks to David Heath Homebrew. If you haven't checked his channel out, definitely check it out. Credit there. The other one I want to give him credit for, although I've used it before and I did it on my own, no one ever told me, is I had a brewing bag one time where things kind of got scorched and I got really upset. So yeah, it's a little steamer basket. You put it in the bottom of your pot and I use it all the time for green beans, things like that or broccoli, it steams. Well, if you're setting this on the bottom of your pot and your bag is sitting there, it's not gonna to touch the bottom. So you, if you have to add additional heat to your pot with your bag in there and your bag's touching towards the bottom, it'll protect the bag from hitting directly on the bottom, which will keep it from burning or sticking like mine did. Mine actually scolded and stuck right to the bottom. It was quite upsetting. My own fault, I turned the heat up a little and walked away like an idiot, but you know, it, ha it happens. Number nine, clamps. Don't have any on me right now, but clamps are kind of cool in that my bag stays. I don't have a problem, but some people, their bag will fall in. And what you can do is you can put those little metal clamps with the silicone tabs on the end. It'll keep your bag from falling in, less problems, less worries, especially if you've got a big pot and your bag is kind of like, you know, floating out there in space. You can do that too, that helps. Number 10. And I'm gonna give, give a bonus one here. So we're gonna go to 11. Number 10 is brewing a bag for non-brewers who don't brew in a bag. I know that sounds confusing. On my anvil, on the grain father, on systems like that, whenever I felt that I got some grains that actually slipped through into the actual wart, I could put this and catch some of those grains and dump it and do that. And just kind of clarify the wart a little bit. And I know a lot of people out there have mentioned that and I know they do it. But the other option, before I realized I could do it that way, is when I had a really bad mess one time. You just take your brew in a bag or even your hot bag and stick it over where the hose is and that way your recirculation is going through and you're catching all that excess matter. You pull it up, drip it, dump it out. That way you're gonna have a little bit clearer beer in the end. So number 11, and this is the bonus, and this is because I know the majority of the people who do brew in a bag are small batch brewers. One gallon, two gallon, all the way up to five, probably six gallon that I'm not aware of, but needless to say, chilling. I know you know this, but you may not have realized something. When you take your pot and you stick it in your sink and it's full of ice water and everything, 
a lot of you've heard agitate the wort. Yeah, definitely agitate the wort because what's going to happen, or in your tub with ice and water, you're going to get that heat. It's going to help release that heat. Different spoon, don't use the same spoon. It won't probably cause a problem, but still, I usually use something different because I don't want to mix my wort with my regular water outside of it. Get that ice water moving. Get it moving. If you've ever put your, and I do it with a, when I do my yeast starters, I'll take a little pot and I'll put it in a big pot that's got ice cold water and I'll move it over to the other side. It gets warm over there. And when I move it over to the other side, it's still cool. And then this side cools down and I keep moving it back and forth and it cools a little faster. But the agitation of the cold water is gonna help pull that heat away because otherwise some of the water closer to that pot's gonna be warm and some of the water above and around it is a little cooler. You wanna keep that agitating. So agitate both the wort and the cold ice water around it. And you'll find that your temperatures drop considerably faster than if you either don't agitate at all or only agitate your wort. So, and that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us here at Bitter Reality Brewing. Don't forget, like, subscribe, keep sharing. Definitely appreciate it. Thank you again for joining us.